These gently rolling fields, so typical of the British countryside, are just a few miles from the city of York. But this innocent looking landscape is soaked in blood. Beneath it lie thousands of human bones. 350 years ago, these fields were the setting for the bloodiest battle ever to be fought on British soil, the Battle of Marston Moor. Fought between the soldiers of the King, Charles I, and the men of Cromwell's Republican army. It was the British equivalent of the Bosnian Civil War. Both armies were cut to ribbons. Whole companies, regiments even, were wiped out. The ground was littered with the dead and the dying. And then on the following day, the scavengers moved in to strip the bodies and tip the corpses into mass graves. Those graves have never been located. Marston Moor remains the final resting place for thousands of unquiet dead. What happens at Marston Moor is that Prince Rupert sets up a trap whereby the enemy opposite are going to come down from their high dry hill, cross over a ditch and a bank and attack his army in the mud of the moor on the far side. It doesn't happen that way because the enemy opposite know that they're going to get into trouble if they come off their hill and the enemy's ready. So they wait until the whole day's gone by and evening has come. Prince Rupert gets tired of waiting, thinks there'll be no battle, knocks off to have his supper. So do his troopers. That's the moment when the parliamentarians decide to attack. They can see campfires going up which indicate the enemy eating their supper, they're off their guard. And they can also see the royalist reinforcements from York marching up in the distance behind. They can't wait for those people to get there and therefore the parliamentarians attack after a thunderstorm of rain when everything is soaking wet and the enemy is at their lowest ebb they plunge in after that nothing is left as night falls except to surround the royalist infantry and kill them or accept their surrender The civil war that raged across this country for several years witnessed many bloody battles as Englishmen killed Englishmen. But Marston Moor stands out as a field of slaughter, where the foot soldiers were trapped in the heart of the battle and cut to pieces by the wheeling cavalry. No quarter was given. Famous regiments were cut down to the last man. The crack regiment from York, the famous White Coats, the crack regiment of the Royalist General of the North, Lord Newcastle, fights to the death. It's offered mercy again and again, but it refuses to take it. Its colonel is shot from his horse, and his remaining men close muskets and pikes together inside uh, a hedged enclosure, and that's their cemetery. They fight on and on and on, shot down from all sides, until there are but a handful remaining, and those are taken prisoners as they fall wounded upon the field. A moon comes out, lighting up the whole ghastly scene of the plunging horses, the screaming and falling men, the pikes waving in their ranks like poles in a bean field in a high wind, and ever and again the puffs of musket smoke coming up from the uh, hedged and entrenched musketeers as the lead shot whistles and plunges again and again to human bodies. Country people are brought in, they dig deep pits. They count 4,200 bodies slung into one group of pits alone. It's very unusual to sustain that amount of carnage in a battlefield in the Civil War. And you remember this is an old-fashioned war with no antiseptics, no antibiotics, no anaesthetics. So for every person killed in the field, you can reckon maybe two or three dying of wounds later. We'll never know the butcher's bill, maybe 8,000, maybe more, as a result of that day. Over 5,000 men lie buried in nameless ditches here. The farmers plying the fields have turned up all kinds of fragments weapons and buttons and buckles and so on. But no one has yet discovered the mass graves. This pond is thought to be one of them. But ever since that hot July day in 1644, there have been stories of men in cavalier or round-head clothing, apparently seeking to escape from the carnage. Well, there are many legends associated with the battle. Um, one of them is the round heads marching up Bloody Lane. Um, whether or not they do, they're supposed to be only seen the top half of them. And you can hear the clank of the armor and the sort of noise of the battle sometimes. Again, there's the headless horseman. He rides across the ridge. Um, different people have seen different things, but um, basically it's all cavaliers and roundheads. Um, people will never go along the road uh, the night of the battle 
um, the 4th of July, 1644, the anniversary of that is considered a, a time when you see ghosts because so many people have seen um, Civil War soldiers going up and down that lane, which is a country lane between the two villages, Marston and Topworth. And I do believe it because so many things have happened in the vicinity of Long Marston. People, even to this day, are still seeing things. I think you've got to sort of be a little bit of a skeptic because locals tend to colour everything rather a lot just to sort of make it sound better but um, over the years you know they, they tend to open up and they come out with quite a few varied and colourful tales and I think out of all of them you can pick out the few that sit, tend to crop up all the time so you know I don't disbelieve in them. Living alongside uh, an old battlefield is often a very uncomfortable experience, especially as this battle, in English terms, wasn't that long ago. It was a particularly bloody battle. Horrible things happened there. Whole regiments were wiped out on the spot. And somewhere or other, that landscape is rich with thousands of human bones, unreclaimed, lost bones, uh, wandering souls. And so it's not surprising that whether or not there's objective truth in paranormal phenomena, people in that area will see and hear things at night. The moor is a tainted place. It has a ghastly reputation. It's a graveyard. It's a graveyard of unquiet dead, those who died screaming, those who never wants to die in that place. And above all, those who died 300 more years ago without Christian burial, no prayer said over them to help them, which is a great comfort to people in that age. Not only did they die in horrible agony, many of them, but they died with the spiritual agony of knowing that nobody was going to whisper a few things to help God take them. Their chances of getting to heaven were dramatically reduced. Similar sightings continue to the present day, often seen by people who have absolutely no knowledge of the battle or its location. One man, for example, an Italian, has very little knowledge of English history. But one night, he was returning home on his motorbike when he narrowly missed two figures limping along the edge of the road, known as Bloody Lane. His name is Piero Prizzi. One night when I finished to work, I was uh, coming back to York and, uh, with the motor bicycle. When, when uh, I arrived uh, on, the, on the bend of this road, just about uh, 50 yards from here, is uh, two people, he was uh, standing in the middle of the road and at the time I thought it was uh, two people dressed like a party dress and uh, at the time I thought he was uh, too drunk you know he's uh, just uh, finished the party and just uh, was going home to try to avoid them I scrape all, uh, all uh, on the, the footpath and I just uh, managed to stand up and nearly crash and uh, I stopped in there and uh, when I turned there was nobody standing but uh, I think it was the shock or, uh, or of the thing, I, I got, uh, it's imprinted to me, you know, the, the two people in, in my brain. It's, it was uh, a light like uh, a floodlight from a theater. And it was, the two people, the light it was inward, but a very, very brilliant light. It was uh, the color, I was able to distinguish the color of everything. One person he was running to to another person, more or less. It's, uh, one he was standing, the other one he was running, and uh, uh, he was uh, with uh, the 17th century boots, the the, the trousers was 17th century. It was uh, the it was blue blue, very very dark blue trousers, with uh, his white shirt all running out. And after the other one, he was uh, st uh, standing and looking towards. He uh, was just a house in front of him, but he was looking like that, very, very intense, like if he was seeing something. Towards, uh, he was looking towards uh, Maston. For people to see and hear the events that took place on a battlefield many years earlier is by no means an uncommon claim. There are stories of such happenings from all over the world and from all ages. In America, for example, are the sites of many of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. The Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia is one such place where Sheridan's army inflicted a major defeat on the Confederate forces.
when all seemed lost, strangely similar indeed to Marston Moor. Many visitors claim to have heard the sounds of the battle, bugles, the shouts and screams of men, the firing of muskets and cannon, coming from nowhere around them as they stood in the sunlight where the soldiers fought. Indeed, hearing the sounds is a remarkably common report. There are extraordinary stories from famous modern battlefields, Dieppe, for example, and Corregidor. And some people claim that the sounds of the muskets, even the high emotions of the battle, still hang over these farmers' fields from 350 years ago. Well, I, I don't walk on the moor uh, anymore. I, I, I really can't bear the, the oppressive feeling. Um, it, it's a very tense feeling. It, I feel as if I can't get off of the moor. I can't get back up to the road. Um, it's a very heavy feeling. It's a feeling of, um, of great disaster, which obviously it, it was, but it's very oppressive. And um, I certainly cannot go any further down the moor than the original uh, musketeer lined ditch line. I can't go past that. It, it, it's frightening. Many people in the Marston area claim to have seen the soldiers from the 17th century, really in groups, sometimes a horseman, most frequently just one or two men together, one perhaps supporting the other. They see them not as wraith-like figures, but as solid bodies, moving along the lanes beside the old battlefield. I'd been at my brother's house along Marston, which is stuck that way. Um, I was cycling back about midnight. Um, I got somewhere near the monument, and something caught my eye that was sort of over here on the ridge. And uh, I didn't look at first, I carried on cycling for a bit and then I stopped because it was in my head and you know, I'd seen something, that, it seemed odd. So I looked up to the ridge and somewhere around about there I saw somebody riding a horse, or walking a horse, you know, they sat on the horse. And uh, I looked and I thought, oh, God, what's that, you know, what, what's somebody doing out this time of night on a horse? And then I sort of realised it wasn't somebody sat on a horse riding, you know, it, it was something else. And I don't know, I didn't know what I thought at the time. I was like mouth open, you know, staring at it. Um, so it was a, a moonlit night um, and it was clear. Um, so I, I, I could see it, but it wasn't like, you know, if you saw a person on a horse, it would be very distinct in moonlight, casting shadows. Well, it, it didn't look like that. It was um, sort of dull, faded. Um, I looked at him for about a minute, minute and a half, and uh, I just decided that was it, I'd seen enough, jumped on my pushbike and cycled home as quick as I could. Um, I kept it to me, pretty much to myself, I told my mum, um, she was quite interested in it, um, but I didn't tell anybody else, I didn't think there was, it was one of them things, you know, that if you go in the pub and say, oh I saw a ghost last night, the whole pub's rolling around laughing, so uh, I didn't say anything, but it, it sticks in my head as clear as it was yesterday, you know, as if I'd seen it last night. I was walking along one evening, uh, watching the sun setting over there and uh, noticed some people walking along the top ridge of the field towards Cromwell's clump and then all of a sudden saw a, a horse and rider come galloping over the ridge and diagonally down the field. Uh, it was a dark horse, the rider on it was dressed in a, a sort of terracotta plant pot coloured um, outfit. Any more description than that I really didn't see. Um, but it was moving at some rate and, and it, it would have a, see, it seemed to me that it was going to collide with the people walking up to the ridge. Anyhow the horse galloped across the, diagonally across the field to where there was a hedge. I don't know where the horse was going to go but as it reached the hedge it actually just dispersed. It was just like a, a, a ball of dust dispersing and it was just an amazing, there was an amazing feeling to, I knew that there was something wrong and went back to the monument and waited for the two people who were walking across the top to come back to the monument 
and asked them if they'd seen this horse because it had gone straight past them and they said no there'd been no horse no rider i'd seen nothing and it was then that i realized that i'd seen something that had no explanation i have a friend who works in weatherby and i see her quite regularly we happen to be talking one day about this um about marston moore and she sort of questioned me and uh, i said well why why the interest she says well we were driving back late one night across the moor and um she says i saw somebody crouching in a ditch and she said i thought he had fancy dress on and uh, i pointed him out to my husband who couldn't see it and i said well he's there and she said he's not there i said he is look um she says by that time we were past and she said, I never thought any more of it. I just thought it was my imagination. She says, and until you start, you know, we started talking about this. And I said, well, it was possibly an apparition because at, at the end of the battle or towards the end of the battle, a lot of the soldiers, um, both cavaliers and roundheads, hid in ditches and bushes and all around trying to sort of escape the sort of troops afterwards so i said it's a possibility it could be an apparition from there hiding in the hedge bottom he might have been killed there october 73 middle evening time i was sitting in the house with just the dog and myself um and the dog started growling and sort of whimpering which was a bit unusual for him because if there's any body around or cars pulling up he used to bark very noisily and so I came to the back door, which was, before this was rebuilt, just over there. And I looked across, and there was somebody leaning on the gate. Um, so as I walked round the drive and started approaching this gate, was, this one's been replaced, but it was in the same sort of position, somebody leaning on it like this. And it, and it just disappeared in, in front of me and um, felt very uneasy, all the hairs on the back of my neck sort of stood up. So I got back into the house and got a torch and had a good look around up and down the road and in the side field, couldn't see any anybody around. And um, the strange thing was that the dog, who would usually be sort of out and run off or if there's anybody visited, he'd be straight to them and jumping up barking he had disappeared back into the house and was behind a chair sort of whimpering and his hackles were up so what is happening in these extraordinary sightings soldiers seen limping from a battlefield 350 years after they've died can they all be dismissed as hallucinations seen as they are by different people at quite different times and hallucinations in any case is simply a vague and slippery word used to describe something we can't explain. Do we have here yet another example where, as some people believe, moments of powerful emotion and the anguish of violent death are trapped in the rocks and stones to be replayed at some later time for those who are keen enough to hear? To make sense of it, we have to step outside the materialist reductionist idea of what a human being is. A very complicated electrochemical physical mechanism with the mind and the personality seated in the brain's operations and that when the brain dies and is destroyed then that is the end of it. If those cases of apparitions of information given that was not in any person any living person's mind are authentic then it would appear that there is a part of a human being that can operate independent of time and space. I'm sure of that. And may even be able to operate independent of mortality. The question of survival of mind after death is one of the oldest problems that we have. I think if you're going to inquire into that, a very good uh, model to look at is the near-death experiences. And we've looked at a large number of near-death experiences. I've had over 2,000 experiences given to our unit. And if you look at these, there is a common feature. And the common features are as follows. When the brain is so disrupted that it can't support consciousness, 
consciousness can occur. So that is a, a really difficult problem for science. The second question is that these people report subjectively a continuation of consciousness in such a way and with such similarity between all the accounts as to lead one to believe that that might in fact be exactly what's happening. So the hypothesis that there is a potentiation of consciousness after brain death I think is on the scientific table and I think we just have to accept that. Yeah, psychologists generally uh, and neurosurgeons uh, are very intrigued with the idea whether the mind is in the brain. Is the mind just the workings of the brain or is the mind working through the brain? That is, is the mind non-physical and normally works through the brain rather like a driver works through a car? And you can't find the brain, sorry, you can't find the mind in the brain any more than you can find the driver in the engine of the car. At the moment, in terms of um, the kind of evidence that we have, it's impossible to decide one way or the other. Now, if you like to take the view, as some people do, that the mind is separate from the brain and usually operates through the brain, then you could say that when the brain dies, the mind survives, and it is that that is actually operating here. An important point that is often overlooked, where the paranormal is concerned, is that it doesn't take a whole battalion, so to speak, of paranormal happenings to challenge and put in question the received wisdom. If just one of these happenings is established or authenticated, it challenges our view of what survives a human being after his worldly death. If we accept that even a small fraction of these cases that have been investigated and accepted as authentic by societies such as the Society for Psychic Research are actually true, that these things actually happened, then they must tell us something about human nature, about human personality. When you do investigations, you find that a lot of people have those experiences. And as I say, even if only a percentage of them are telling the truth, then they mean something. Professor Archie Roy is by no means alone in believing that we've gone well beyond the time of asking if these events are happening. Science, he argues, must now move on to grapple with the implications of their occurrence. You've got to start saying, supposing this is true, what does it mean? And I think that we have come to the stage, oh, quite a few years ago, with respect to psychic phenomena. We have to say, supposing the findings in the various branches of psychical research are true, what does it mean for human personality? And I think we have to take that leap. We have to try desperately to give reliable theories of process. They are, they are the only things that will give us fresh observations to make and the only things that will persuade people to take the subject seriously. is uh, two people, he was uh, standing in the middle of the road and uh, at the time I thought it was uh, two people dressed like a party dress and uh, at the time I thought he was uh, too drunk, you know, he uh, just uh, finished the party and just uh, was going home. To try to avoid them, I scrape all, uh, all uh, on the, the footpath and I just uh, managed to stand up and nearly crash. And uh, I stopped in there, and uh, when I turned, it was nobody standing. But uh, I think it was the shock or, uh, or of the thing. I, it's, I got, uh, it's imprinted to me, you know, the, the two people in, in my brain. It's, it was uh, a light like a, a floodlight from a theater. And it was, the two people, the light it was inward but a very, very brilliant light. It was uh, the color, I was able to distinguish the color of everything. One person, it was running to, to another person, more or less. It's, uh, one, he was standing, the other one, he was running, and uh, uh, he was uh, with uh, the 17th century boots, 
the, the, the trousers it was 17th century it was the it was blue blue very very dark blue trousers with the, his white shirt all hanging out and after the other one he was uh, uh, standing and looking towards he was just a house in front of him but he was looking like that very very intense like if he was seeing something towards he was looking towards master For people to see and hear the events that took place on a battlefield many years earlier is by no means an uncommon claim. There are stories of such happenings from all over the world and from all ages. In America, for example, are the sites of many of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. The Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia is one such place where Sheridan's army inflicted a major defeat on the Confederate forces when all seemed lost. Strangely similar indeed to Marston Moore. Many visitors claim to have heard the sounds of the battle, bugles, the shouts and screams of men, the firing of muskets and cannon, coming from nowhere around them as they stood in the sunlight where the soldiers fought. Indeed, hearing the sounds is a remarkably common report. There are extraordinary stories from famous modern battlefields, Dieppe, for example, and Corregidor, by people who have absolutely no knowledge of the battle or its location. One man, for example, an Italian, has very little knowledge of English history. But one night, he was returning home on his motorbike when he narrowly missed two figures, limping along the edge of the road, known as Bloody Lane. His name is Piero Prizzi. One night, when I finished to work, I was uh, coming back to York and, uh, with the motorbicycle. When, when uh, I arrived uh, on the on the bend of this road, just about 50 yards from here, is uh, two people who was standing in the middle of the road. And uh, at the time I thought it was uh, two people dressed like a party dress. And uh, at the time I thought it was uh, too drunk, you know, he's uh, just uh, finished the party and just uh, was going home. To try to avoid them, I scrape all, uh, all uh, on the, the footpath and I just managed to stand up and nearly crash. And I stopped in there. And when I turned, there was nobody standing. But uh, I think it was the shock or, uh, or of the thing. I, it's, I got, uh, it's imprinted to me, you know, the, the two people in, in my brain. It's, it was uh, a light like uh, a floodlight from a theater. And it, it was the two people, the light was inward, but a very, very brilliant light. It was uh, the color, I was able to distinguish the color of everything. One person, it was running to, to another person, more or less. It's, uh, one he was standing, the other one he was running, and uh, uh, he was uh, with uh, the 17th century boots. The, the, the trousers was 17th century. It was the it was blue blue, very very dark blue trousers, with the, his white shirt all hanging out. And after the other one, he was uh, st uh, standing and looking towards. He was just a house in front of him, but he was looking like that, very very intense, like if he was seeing something. Towards, uh, he was looking towards uh, Maston. For people to see and hear the events that took place on a battlefield many years earlier is by no means an uncommon claim. There are stories of such happenings from all over the world and from all ages. In America, for example, are the sites of many of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia. And the dog started growling and sort of whimpering, which was a bit unusual for him, because if there was anybody around or cars pulling up, he used to bark very noisily. And so I came to the back door, which was, before this was rebuilt, just over there. And I looked across and there was somebody 
leaning on the gate. Um, so as I walked round the drive and started approaching this gate, was, this one's been replaced, but it was in the same sort of position, somebody leaning on it like this, and it, and it just disappeared in, in front of me and um, felt very uneasy, all the hairs on the back of my neck sort of stood up. So I got back into the house and got a torch and had a good look around up and down the road and in the side field, couldn't see any anybody around and um, the strange thing was that the dog who would usually be sort of out and run off or if there's anybody visited he'd be straight to them and jumping up and barking he had disappeared back into the house and was behind a chair sort of whimpering and his hackles were up so what is happening in these extraordinary sightings Soldiers seen limping from a battlefield 350 years after they've died. Can they all be dismissed as hallucinations, seen as they are by different people at quite different times? And hallucinations in any case is simply a vague and slippery word used to describe something we can't explain. Do we have here yet another example where, as some people believe, moments of powerful emotion and the anguish of violent death are trapped in the rocks and stones? be replayed at some later time for those who are keen enough to hear. To make sense of it, we have to step outside the materialist reductionist idea of what a human being is. A very complicated electrochemical physical mechanism with the mind and the personality seated in the brain's operations and that when the brain dies and is destroyed, then that is the end of it. If those cases of apparitions, of information given that was not in any person, any living person's mind, are authentic, then it would appear that there is a part of a human being that can operate independent of time and space. I'm sure of that. And may even be able to operate independent of mortality. The question of survival of mind after death is one of the oldest problems that we have. I think if you're going to inquire into that, a very good uh, model in fact be exactly what's happening. So the hypothesis that there is a potentiation of consciousness after brain death, I think is on the scientific table. And I think we just have to accept that. Yeah, psychologists generally uh, and neurosurgeons uh, are very intrigued with the idea whether the mind is in the brain. Is the mind just the workings of the brain? Or is the mind working through the brain? That is, is the mind non-physical and normally works through the brain rather like a driver works through a car? And you can't find the brain, sorry, you can't find the mind in the brain any more than you can find the driver in the engine of the car. At the moment, in terms of um, the kind of evidence that we have, it's impossible to decide one way or the other. Now, if you like to take the view, as some people do, that the mind is separate from the brain and usually operates through the brain, then you could say that when the brain dies, the mind survives, and it is that that is actually operating here. An important point that is often overlooked, where the paranormal is concerned, is that it doesn't take a whole battalion, so to speak, of paranormal happenings to challenge and put in question the received wisdom. If just one of these happenings is established or authenticated, it challenges our view of what survives a human being after his worldly death. If we accept that even a small fraction of these cases that have been investigated and accepted as authentic by societies such as the Society for Psychic Research are actually true, that these things actually happened, then they must tell us something about human nature, about human personality. When you do investigations, you find that a lot of people have those experiences. And as I say, even if only a percentage of them are telling the truth, then they mean something. Professor Archie Roy is by no means alone in believing that we've gone well beyond the time of asking if these events are happening. Science, he argues, must now move on to grapple with the implications of their occurrence. You've got to start saying, supposing this is true, what does it mean? And I think that we have come to the stage, oh, quite a few years ago, with respect to psychic phenomena. We have to say, supposing 
the findings in the various branches of psychical research are true, what does it mean for human personality? And I think we have to take that leap. We have to try desperately to give reliable theories of process. They are, they are the only things that will give us fresh observations to make and the only things that will persuade people to take the subject seriously. Where the horse was going to go, but as it reached the hedge, it actually just dispersed. It was just like a, a, a ball of dust dispersing. And it was just an amazing, there was an amazing feeling to, I knew that there was something wrong. And went back to the monument and waited for the two people who were walking across the top to come back to the monument and asked them if they'd seen this horse because it had gone straight past them and they said no, there'd been no horse, no rider, I'd seen nothing and it was then that I realised that I'd seen something that had no explanation. I have a friend who works in Weatherby and I see her quite regularly. We happened to be talking one day about this, um, about Marston Moor and she sort of questioned me and uh, I said well why why the interest she says well we were driving back late one night across the moor and um, she says I saw somebody crouching in a ditch and she said I thought he had fancy dress on and uh, I pointed him out to my husband who couldn't see it and I said well he's there and she said he's not there I said he is look and um, she says by that time we were past and she said, I never thought any more of it. I just thought it was my imagination. She says, and until you start, you know, we started talking about this. And I said, well, it was possibly an apparition because at, at the end of the battle or towards the end of the battle, a lot of the soldiers, um, both cavaliers and roundheads, hid in ditches and bushes and all around trying to sort of escape the sort of troops afterwards so I said it's a possibility it could be an apparition from there hiding in the hedge bottom he might have been killed there October 73 middle evening time I was sitting in the house with just the dog and myself um, and the dog started growling and sort of whimpering which was a bit unusual for him because if there's any body around or cars pulling up he used to bark very noisily and so I came to the back door, which was, before this was rebuilt, just over there. And I looked across, and there was somebody leaning on the gate. Um, so as I walked round the drive and started approaching this gate, was, this one's been replaced, but it was in the same sort of position, somebody leaning on it like this. And it, and it just disappeared in, in front of me and I um, felt very uneasy, all the hairs on the back of my neck sort of stood up. So I got back into the house and got a torch jumping up, barking. He had disappeared back into the house and was behind a chair, sort of whimpering, and his hackles were up. So what is happening in these extraordinary sightings? Soldiers seen limping from a battlefield 350 years after they've died. Can they all be dismissed as hallucinations, seen as they are by different people at quite different times. And hallucinations in any case is simply a vague and slippery word used to describe something we can't explain. Do we have here yet another example where, as some people believe, moments of powerful emotion and the anguish of violent death are trapped in the rocks and stones to be replayed at some later time for those who are keen enough to hear. To make sense of it, we have to step outside the materialist, reductionist idea of what a human being is. A very complicated electrochemical, physical mechanism with the mind and the personality seated in the brain's operations and that when the brain dies and is destroyed, then that is the end of it. If those cases of apparitions, of information given that was not in any person, any living person's mind, are authentic, 
then it would appear that there is a part of a human being that can operate independent of time and space. I'm sure of that, and may even be able to operate independent of mortality. The question of survival of mind after death is one of the oldest problems that we have. I think if you're going to inquire into that, a very good uh, model to look at is the near-death experiences. And we've looked at a large number of near-death experiences. I've had over 2,000 experiences given to our unit. And if you look at these, there is a common feature. And the common features are as follows. When the brain is so disrupted that it can't support consciousness, consciousness can occur. So that is a, a really difficult problem for science. The second question is that these people report subjectively a continuation of consciousness in such a way and with such similarity between all the accounts as to lead one to believe that that might in fact be exactly what's happening. So the hypothesis that there is a potentiation of consciousness after brain death, I think is on the scientific table. And I think we just have to accept that. Yeah, psychologists generally uh, and neurosurgeons uh, are very intrigued with the idea whether the mind is in the brain. Is the mind just the workings of the brain? Or is the mind working through the brain? That is, is the mind non-physical?